What's up designers and welcome back to Remton Games. In today's episode of Game Designer Spotlight, we're going to be taking a look at the Master of the Multiverse, the Tycoon of Trading Cards, the Flying Purple Hippopotamus himself, Richard Garfield, PhD. As always, we're going to be taking a look at his life and career, as well as the process and philosophy behind his game designs. Without further ado, let's get started. Richard Garfield was born in Philadelphia in 1963. You could say he comes from a lineage of success. His great-great-grandfather was President James Garfield, and his Aunt Faye Jones was a well-known artist whose work can be seen on the magic card Stasis. It has also been claimed that his great-uncle invented the paperclip, but I have been unable to verify this. Garfield's father was an architect, and his career resulted in the family moving around a lot during Richard's childhood, before finally settling in Oregon around 1975. Like most game designers, Richard Garfield was interested in games and puzzles for most of his childhood, but this interest didn't become a passion until he was introduced to Dungeons & Dragons. Fascinated by the way that Dungeons & Dragons stretched boundaries and blended the role of player and designer, Garfield fell in love not only with D&D, but with gaming in general. My reaction was a bit different than many of my peers. Rather than falling in love with Dungeons & Dragons, I fell in love with games in general. I began to seek out and play all sorts of new games. Traditional games, war games, popular games, niche games, role-playing games, and on and on. When I found a game that I didn't immediately like, I would play it until I learned to appreciate what it did for its players. I studied game strategy books and game history books. I designed my own games and fantasized about being a game designer. I think it's notable that Garfield was not only attracted to games that he personally liked, but was also interested in games that he didn't enjoy and would work to try to understand the appeal. I think it's easy to try and only design the types of games that you like, but not every player has your same preferences and it's important to understand those players as well. Despite his interest, however, by the time Garfield got into college, he didn't really see game design as a viable career path. After all, each day in the newspaper there were movie reviews and bestseller lists, but hardly anything about games. If games weren't even big enough to get a bestseller list or review in the paper once a year, must be pretty small potatoes. Fortunately, this didn't dampen his enthusiasm for studying and designing games, and he chose to study combinatorial mathematics partially due to its usefulness in understanding game systems and partially because it's just so much dang fun. Just because he wasn't pursuing game design as a career path, however, doesn't mean that Garfield stopped designing games altogether. He continued designing games and playing those games with his friends all throughout his college career and into his early teaching. One of these games was Robo Rally, a game about programming robots to navigate a dangerous factory floor filled with lasers, conveyor belts, and other obstacles. Garfield had designed Robo Rally in 1985, but never really tried to get it published as he believed it would be too much unpleasant work. One of Garfield's gaming buddies, Mike Davis, must have really loved the game because he offered to do the work to help get the game published. Richard agreed and said that he would give him half the game if he did. Over the next several years, Davis took the game from company to company trying to get it published, and while he got close several times, he was never successful because the game didn't really fit into those companies' existing lines of games. Undeterred, Davis decided to try pitching to a startup instead, believing that there would be less baggage that way. In 1991, he pitched the game to Wizards of the Coast. Wizards at the time was a very young startup company that mostly published supplements for role-playing games, and while they seemed interested in the game, it was too expensive for them to publish. They would, however, be interested in publishing a cheaper game, something made mostly of paper and cardboard. Specifically, as they mostly made role-playing supplements, they were interested in a game that was quick to play, so it could be played in between role-playing sessions, and was lightweight and portable so it could be carried around at conventions. Garfield had just the thing, an idea to combine card games with baseball cards. He further combined this with an old prototype he had called Five Magics, a fantasy card game inspired by the James Dean of board games, Cosmic Encounter. 
I find the early development period of Magic the Gathering to be quite fascinating. In fact, it's up there in the top five of my places I would go with a time machine, right next to the Empire Strikes Back premiere and YouTube in 2008 when it was still possible to grow a channel from scratch. For this reason, I believe that the early development of Magic probably deserves its own history of game design somewhere down the line, so for now I'll just hit on some of the highlights. Magic was under development for about two years, and during this time Garfield employed a number of groups of playtesters to help develop his game. Many of these early playtesters, including Scaff Elias and Barry Reich, would become important figures in the history of the game. Since this was a completely new genre, there were tons of design problems that had to be solved. From how do you prevent players from simply filling their decks only with the best cards, and how do you create a range of playable cards at a variety of different scales and power levels. Answering these sorts of questions led to the creation of vital mechanics such as the mana system and the color pie. Designing the core mechanics wasn't the only problem that Garfield and his playtesters faced, however. They also had to create a large set of varied cards for players to discover, trade, and build their decks with. This also meant he had to deal with problems of distribution. How would the cards be separated into rarity, and how would cards be organized into packs? There were also legal issues involved. At the time, Wizards of the Coast was involved with a lawsuit with Palladium Books over one of their RPG supplements. So to protect Magic the Gathering legally, they originally published under a separate company, Garfield Games. There were also legal concerns around the name of the game. For most of development, the game was simply referred to as Magic, but this is such a common word that it couldn't really be trademarked. They tried changing the name to Mana Clash, but they found that people were still stuck on calling it Magic. So eventually they decided to add The Gathering to the end, which made the title distinctive enough to protect. Despite all these challenges, the game would finally be publicly released in August of 1993 and quickly became a massive success. The success of the initial release, known as Alpha, far outpaced expectations and laid the foundation for the ongoing popularity of this game that's still going strong after 27 years. After publishing Alpha, Garfield mostly stepped back from designing Magic. He did design the game's first expansion, Arabian Nights, and has contributed to other expansions over the years such as Ravnica City of Guilds and Dominaria. However, Richard's attention soon turned to other projects. After all, who would want to keep designing expansions for the same game over and over forever? After releasing Magic, Garfield continued to work at Wizards of the Coast for the next 10-ish years. He finally got Robo Rally published in 1994, and in the years since it has received several expansions and re-releases. He also designed, either in whole or in part, several other trading card games for Wizards in the mid to late 90s, including Vampire The Eternal Struggle, Netrunner, and the very first Star Wars trading card game. As lead designer at Wizards, he also helped shape the entire culture and design philosophy of the research and development department, moving more to a data-oriented, almost scientific process rather than one built mostly on intuition. However, in the early 2000s, Garfield left Wizards to become an independent designer. Since going solo, he's worked on a number of notable games, including the multiple Golden Geek Award winning King of Tokyo in 2011, the unique deck card game Keyforge, and Artifact, which, like most of its player base, let's just leave that one alone. Now that we've looked at his life and career, let's take a closer look at his philosophy towards making games. One interesting thing about being the creator of an entire genre of games is that much of Garfield's philosophy towards trading card games have simply become established industry practice. It's basically impossible to make a new game in this space without being influenced by his designs. One big lesson that can be taken from his designs, however, is not to be afraid of randomness. In fact, in an interview with Escapist magazine, Garfield explains that in his opinion, most video games don't have enough randomness. One of the areas that interests me most in computer games is the lack of luck. Almost all computer games are extremely skill-based in the sense that the most skilled player will almost always win. 
In paper games, from Scrabble to Backgammon and Bridge to Poker, there are many games where the less skilled player can win from time to time. And extraordinarily, all these games have an immense amount of skill as well. Someday, I hope to have a collection of games that I can play on computer with dabblers and experts at the same time that is comparable to the immense collection of paper games I have which accomplish that. Garfield doesn't consider randomness or luck to be the opposite of skill, and his designs make a pretty good case for the idea that randomness, when applied properly, can actually increase the level of skill in a game. Simply look at Magic the Gathering. This game has a whole lot of luck involved, but is also incredibly skillful. In fact, it's such a skill-intensive game that it has a thriving competitive tournament scene, a tournament scene that Garfield himself was instrumental in shaping. I've always loved serious analysis and play of games. I became convinced that the existence of these things doesn't hurt the casual player, and in fact is a boon to them. The analogy we drew was from basketball in the NBA. A lot of players who play basketball at the YMCA have no dream of being in the NBA, and yet, without a robust, serious game core, they would probably be playing something else. By steering the game in this direction, I think we added a lot to the breadth of its interest and its longevity. Helping develop an official system of competitive magic was only one of the ways that Garfield helped shape the long-term development of this game, and fits very well with his player-focused philosophy. My main contribution to Magic during this time was constantly focusing on the players and trying to guide the decisions to maximize value to them, rather than the many competing forces like speculator, collector, distributor, shopkeeper, art enthusiast, or story enthusiast. Powerful common cards, a strong tournament system, printing enough cards that the short-term speculators left, these are samples of the sort of decisions that I was part of and pleased with. There are plenty of bad decisions made as well, but they have faded because I think the lessons got learned and we moved on. The last thing I can say about Richard Garfield is that he is a true scholar and loves studying about games. Whether this involves exploring the roots of an obscure ancient genre of games, or taking the rules of classic card games and rearranging them, Garfield truly seems to love studying and learning about games. Fortunately, he also seems to love teaching about them. Not only has he taught college courses on the subject, but he has written a wealth of content on the topic of game design. These include his older columns, Lost in the Shuffle, as well as the book Characteristics of Games, which he co-wrote with Scaphalias. While there's only so much I can fit in one video, these resources would both be great places to start if you wanted to learn more about his thoughts on designing games. That's all I have for today. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe so you don't miss more videos like this in the future. If you want to see more, you can check out my previous video where I showed you how I programmed an AI to play Pokemon Emerald. There's also the previous entry in this series where I focused on strategy game designer Sid Meier. And join me next time for part 5 of my Evolution of Pokemon design series. Until then, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all next time.